Yes, we're going to tape. We're... Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for reminding us. Did you do it in the cloud? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, thank you all for being here. I think we have some other artists that have joined us, so this is really exciting. And uh, welcome everyone to our series of an artist's journey. And Arlene Leventhal is one of us. She's a learning collaborative member, but she's also a gifted artist. And I've loved getting to know her and see her wonderful work. So you're really in for an incredible treat today. And uh, Arlene's gonna tell us a little bit about herself. And then we're gonna see much of her work that's displayed in her, in, in her apartment and also things that she's done. And you'll see her studio and some of her the work, the tools that she uses. So I'm going to let Arlene take it over from here. <laughs> and just to tell you, you can put if you go up to view, you could put uh, either gallery view or you can have a uh, full screen. So you'll be able to see Arlene's full screen, don't you? No, no, not yet. She's going to talk. Go ahead. Welcome. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to talk to all of you from my little studio, which is basically an overcrowded second bedroom. Um, <laughs> I have no room for anything else to go in here, not even a toothpick. This is it. Um, so I'll, I'll first, I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about my background, and then we have slides to show you, and then some other things to talk about. Um, from, from my real childhood, I was always interested in art, uh, crafts, making things, and I was basically encouraged to do that. Um, my parents provided what I needed. Um, I didn't have a sewing machine. They had a broken one, but I, I sewed by hand. I made doll clothes. I drew. I did all the things that indicated that I was interested in art. Um, but I was fortunate that between um, kindergarten and eighth grade, I had the same art teacher. And she was encouraging. And she basically... Um, treated me a little differently. She had me copy pictures, which as an art teacher, I would never do with anybody else. Um, and she, in my seventh grade or eighth grade, she told my parents about music and art high school. Uh, they came to see her and they were mortified at the thought of my traveling an hour and a half on a subway into Manhattan and an hour and a half home. But I persisted in wanting to do this and took a test and got in. In the beginning, I thought I could take both art and music because I did play the piano, but we had to select one and it was definitely art. So music and art was a, an opening of a whole new world for me. Uh, being out of my neighborhood and meeting people from all over the city that were commuting like I was. And um, what was interesting really was being together with people that lived in totally different surroundings from uh, one friend who, <laughs> whose father was a sculptor and they lived in his loft in Long Island City with the oxyacetylene torch, et cetera, to another Saturday visiting a friend whose butler lived on Park Avenue, whose butler opened the door. And it was uh, being in the city like that made me not afraid to go to museums. And I uh, would go on Saturdays and basically we were not afraid of anything in those early years uh, in the city. I was went all over. Um, at music and art, I was a ceramics major. Um, the privilege of being a ceramics major was you could wear jeans, unlike anybody else in school. <laughs> and we had a nine period day, four, four were art classes and five were academics. It was a very tough school in, in many ways, but it was probably the best experience I could have had. But it really didn't prepare me for teaching because everybody there was so eager to learn and was interested in art and music that it was not like the real world. Uh, in the summers, I had art related jobs. I was a ceramics counselor. I worked for AC Nielsen, which was a um, trend before uh, online stuff, <coughs> making charts to show television ratings. I had to use a speedball pen, which I had never seen before, but I learned how to do it. I also worked with Simplicity Patterns one summer. I was a virtual sewer. I didn't know very much, but I would do the drawings for the darts and everything else. So I understood how to sew, but I never really did it. And, um, and I met people through that. So then uh, after uh, music and art, I went to Brooklyn College 
I was an art education major. Actually, my high school teacher, um, my ceramics teacher wanted me to apply to go to either Alfred, which I applied to, got in, and I wasn't interested, which it was a ceramic school, or Black Mountain College, which was a very famous art school that actually closed a few years later. But I was perfectly content to go to Brooklyn College. The art department was very famous in terms of abstract expressionists. We had very famous artists who used the, how can I say, the teaching job as their secure income. And they were still learning uh, how to process their work and how to display. But uh, a lot of them became very famous. I'll mention one who was an esoteric type, uh, Ad Reinhardt, who did the old black paintings. I had him for an art workshop a few times, plus a theory of art class. I didn't really understand his minimalism at the time, but I, through the years, I understood it. And um, it was an interesting place to, to, be, to be at school. I got married young, I was 20. Actually, I was still in, um, at, at uh, Brooklyn College. My husband was uh, a graduate student and um, he was going for his PhD in physics and I was the sole support, so I was the teacher. And I got a job uh, teaching at a high school. I was all of 20 and a half. The students, some of them were 18. It was quite an experience. Um, not at all like the school I had come from. But I did take, in the years that I was teaching before anything else, I took workshops. I continued studying at the Brooklyn Museum. Um, I had, um, actually I had one of the Sawyer brothers and I had gone to school with Mary Sawyer, who was one of the Sawyer children. And I took classes at the Botanic Gardens and I'm gonna show you later. I took a class in Sumiate painting, which is calligraphy, uh, working with ink. And that was very peaceful and calm, very Zen-like, I loved it. And I started sewing. Um, I, <laughs> I told my husband when he finally started working, the first thing I wanted was a sewing machine. So we got a very simple singer, which I've since upgraded to a Bernina, and I started sewing. So I wasn't really doing art in those years. I was basically involved with teaching and um, I had two daughters and the usual, you know, taking them to tennis classes, Hebrew school, uh, the usual thing that we do with our kids. Uh, I was very busy. We moved several times. Um, my husband, who started out as a research physicist, left Philips where he was working, which is a Dutch company, and went into the corporate world doing IT. So because of his moving, we moved all too many times. Actually, I've moved, including NIAC, this is my eighth move. So my life was very complicated because of, of the moves. So we left New York, the New York area, and he got a job in Georgetown in Maryland. And I started teaching in Maryland. And that was an experience because the, the art budget was so low that I had 35 schools that had no art teacher. And I was the resource person that had to run around to the schools and give the teachers ideas, what to teach, how to teach. You know, They would rather have me in there, but there was no way I could do it all. And it was, it was an interesting job and I liked it. I would have a, a newsletter every week. I would get in touch with everybody. It was very stimulating. But the best thing about Maryland was I was in the Montgomery County school system. They got a grant from the Kennedy Center and I did curriculum writing and that was really wonderful. We, we had, I was the art person. There was a, a, a music teacher, a dance teacher and a drama teacher. And we developed a curriculum, an interrelated <laughs> arts curriculum, which we worked on in the summer. And the teachers during the year had pilot programs that tried them out. And the following summer, we got their comments and changed what had to be changed for the classes. Very often, we tried to combine the classes with social studies, with science. You know, we tried to get not just the pure arts in there, but to get the whole core curriculum. Um, but Montgomery County had excellent schools. And then we moved to California. By that time, my girls were not with us. I had one in uh, college and, uh, and one in medical school, and then the other one wound up in law school. So we had a lot of tuition. And we went ourselves 
And I had never been to California before we moved there. And I have to say it took an adjustment, but after a while I got to love the, uh, the climate. I, I loved a lot of things about it. The only thing I didn't love was, I'll get to that in a minute, is we had a big earthquake. But in California, I couldn't get a real teaching job. So I taught um, after school uh, in Richmond. I taught in various private places. Um, I didn't want to teach in LA County because it was a very difficult place. And I lived outside, I lived really near where the Kardashians live, but not, not there. And those schools had money to have after school art enrichment programs. But the sad thing is they didn't hire an art teacher when they had money, they hired a phys ed teacher. So I did, I did my teaching as much as I could. And then one very interesting thing was teaching um, at a college called Cal Lutheran, which is out in Simi Valley. If anybody has been to the Reagan Library, it's out there. They had fires there last year. Um, I taught in service to teachers and they were the regular teachers in, in up to grade six that had to be presented classes and ideas. And I, I really enjoyed that, that worked very well. And I did that for a few summers, but then we had an earthquake and the earthquake was a 7.2 and uh, it changed my life completely. For a while we stayed in the house then we had to move out and um, it was fixed. And, you know, we, we went through the, the whole routine of, of the earthquake repairs and so on and so forth. And the one thing, though, in California that was really great for the rest of my life was I, since I wasn't teaching full time, I started doing watercolors. And I basically untaught myself from the traditional school of watercolors. You'll see my slides where traditionally you're taught to leave the white of the paper and have very little layering. And I worked in a more realistic way. And I really felt as if I was accomplishing something new for me. I also uh, began quilting in a serious way, which I was never interested in before. It seemed ridiculous to take perfectly good fabric and cut it up and do something else with it. But I realized the design possibilities were terrific. And I was in a very um, learned guild with people that had written books and a couple of them were like me. They were art teachers that had left teaching and had gone into quilting full time. So it, I had the opportunity in California to do the quilting as well. And then I also started doing jewelry. Um, there were wonderful stones available and people that were knowledgeable. And um, I started taking classes and became interested in it, which I then came back to New York and continued. So this was all pre 9-11. And um, so as a total, my total teaching career was about 24 years. I taught from K through 12 and then I taught in college for a little bit. And then we moved back here. Um, my husband was sort of semi-retired and, and we wound up in Pomona and I had a wonderful amount of space in Pomona. I had a messy room, I had a quilting room, I had all kinds of places to spread out, which I never had in my life and never had again. And we lived there for um, 18 years. Uh, he passed away and uh, I downsized. I donated truckloads of fabric and paper to various art schools in Nyack thinking I only needed a minimum amount of stuff. Well, then COVID hit <laughs> and I realized I was in the house a lot. So I took out everything. And um, the only thing I really couldn't do was I guess I didn't have access to is I, I couldn't do any work with clay, but I continued painting. And, and then I decided that the one medium that I was not familiar with or not comfortable with was pastels. So I took an online class Zoom class here from my apartment in Clarkstown with a wonderful pastel person. I think her name is Joyce Burns. She and I are part of the virtual exhibits at the Valley Cottage Library. So I did pastels in a new way that I hadn't done before my pastels were all muddy. These came out nice and clean. And then I also took an acrylic class. I went up to the Catskill area with a friend and I did that one summer. And, and then being in as much as I was in, I did a lot of quilting. 
And the quilting has given me a lot of pleasure because I generally, I am giving it to people, whether it's baby quilts or whatever. And um, so I, I really keep myself busy. I'd like to show you some slides and then afterwards show you some of the materials that I have here that I'd like to talk about. If you could start with the slides. Who's there? <laughs> okay. Okay, this is my um, workspace, my studio. I have everything I could possibly fit in there. Uh, I have beads, fabric, uh, everything, and everything is on the wall and a minimum amount of, of uh, books and, and other stuff. And I have papers and folders behind things, so it's working out just fine. Um, I could use more space, but then I transfer to the living room floor when I have a big something to do. Next. Okay, this, this is pretty typical of the watercolors that I started doing. This was done after a visit to Giverny, the Monet Garden. And, um, and it's sort of an impressionistic style. Um, I like to work loosely. Um, but it's always, if you're working realistically, it's always difficult not to get too realistic. But this one is nice and loose, and I was happy with the, um, the background and the water. Uh, this is a, a typical watercolor. Next. Uh, if you've been to Sedona, this may look familiar. Uh, this started out as a sketch, and then I came home and... Um, painted from the sketch. I did a few notes there, uh, trying to get the red rocks and the cactus. Next. Okay, now this is um, a watercolor that I did here. And I was in this one, I was trying to be looser. So this is a smoke tree that has this purplish red and a garden in front. Actually, it's in somebody's house in Rockland and I couldn't resist doing it. I did this sitting there while I was sketching and I finished it at home. I really enjoyed this. I wish I had a smoke tree in my yard to have these colors. Next. Okay, this one is an interesting one because it's a watercolor that's on Yupo paper. Yupo paper has no tooth. So it, it, it allows the paint to run where it wants. And and you have less control over it. So I was doing this when I thought my work was getting to be too tight. And this kind of took off by itself. Uh, this one um, was a picture that was uh, a sketch originally from the Botanic Gardens. You know, they have the, uh, in, in the Bronx, they have the ponds and um, uh, the lilies. So this was sort of a free version of, of, a, of a landscape that went its own way. Next. Uh, this is a typical snow scene. Uh, I did this probably up in the country. Um, I enjoyed, in fact, I enjoyed coming back from California and experiencing the winter. <laughs> it was a little too warm there all the time. Next. Um, there was another one under there. Okay, well, I, I have a number of still lifes. I like to do still lifes. I would set up, these are objects that I own. This uh, shoe is a brass estriba. It's a Spanish saddle thing. And the sculpt, the um, pot plate in the back came from Russia. My husband traveled a lot, so he brought it back. And the pictures were from Spain and I like using my own things and the advantage is uh, I could, I could uh, see them in different light and I would put them near a window and I even took a photograph of them because it couldn't stay there forever. My watercolors uh, work very slowly and I have to say it could take me almost a month to finish them because I would keep going back and layering. You could see the, the shadows here are, are deeper blue so I didn't leave the white of the paper here. I just, you know, layered on top. Next. No, you, there was another um, 
there was an, another, another one or two slides of, of still lifes. One of them is, is the Glocksin. Yeah, you see? Yeah, that one. Okay, there's two or three, right. That one uh, was after a trip to Hawaii. We went to a, um, a protea farm. Those are protea, the large bulbous flowers. And, um, and in back of it, there's a Hawaiian quilt. And I was really taken with the combination of the reds and the, and, and, yeah, and the reds and the um, Hawaiian quilt in back of the Hawaiian flowers. Next. Okay. This is also my objects, the, um, the little silver bowl I have in the living room. It's um, a hammered silver from Peru. And um, I was very fortunate. I had a sister-in-law that lived in Peru and Japan and she was autistic. So she always sent me great things and I've used them. Um, you can see the, the shadows in the vase where it's white. Uh, I discovered uh, a little trick that I didn't know about. There's a certain kind of acrylic medium that you can put on there and then you paint over it and then you remove this, it's waxy, and you try to get the edges um, uh, not so crisp, try to rub them in. So there were ways of um, avoiding leaving the white of the paper but still saving them through other technical means. So I, I learned a lot about watercolors. Next. Um, this is this one you showed. No, wait, wait, wait. You, you missed the one here. This one with the lemons and the flowers. I love doing pottery. This is a majolica vase and lemons and, and especially like flowers. I, um, I like getting the shadings, the colors and, um, okay, I think there was one more. Um, no, there was one more. Um, no. That was a gloxinia plant that was red. That was my favorite. No. Okay, we'll skip it. I will show that. That's the one. Okay. This one is a special one because of all my paintings, this is the only one that was shown in a very prestigious place. This was in a show at the Salma Gundy Gallery on Fifth Avenue and 13th Street. It was a non member show, and I was encouraged to try to get something in there by someone that I knew that was a member. And they selected this one. And, uh, this was a real Gloxinia plant that I had and I love painting it and um, I have it here in my workroom. And at one point, I, a few people wanted to buy it. So what I did was I made Gicle prints and sold the prints, but I have the original. Uh, when you go into a gallery to buy something, very often the, the, um, the Gicle is, is the way they reproduce it. It's done on a digital machine and uh, comes out very authentic in terms of color and texture and everything else. Okay, continue. Now we can go on to the plein air pictures. Okay. Okay, now one of my favorite things to do is to sketch outdoors. And I've done a little bit of traveling in my life. And um, I sometimes just, you can see the small, um, horizontal watercolors. Those were done in Palm Desert in an oasis, which I used to go to pretty much every year and continued. Sometimes I'd save the paintings from one year to the next or I'd make new ones. And what I liked was this was the, the Eau Naturale palm tree. It was not um, cut. And uh, this was with all the hairy stuff still on it. It's the way it grows people that saw it say, oh, it's a different kind of palm tree. I said, no, no, it's a real palm tree. It just hasn't been manicured. And then um, the other pictures were from Alaska on a cruise and the one below was um, in France. It was a, um, a bed and breakfast, actually a 15th century place that we stayed at that was really beautiful. So this plein air sketching has stayed with me. It's something I can do from here anywhere and I really enjoy it. Sometimes a painting comes out of it and sometimes it just stays a sketch. Continue. I don't know why this is in this file, but this is one of the few abstract paintings that I did. This was watercolors. Um, I started out, and I guess the reason I put it in is I started out in the beginning doing a lot of abstractions, but became much more interested in nature in the real state. Um, but it, this was fun to do, and this, I, I still have this. A lot of my paintings, when I downsized, 
uh, were given away to family members. Some were sold previously. So I have relatively few of my own things in my apartment. Next. Now this should look familiar. This is from um, the launch next to Memorial Park, looking at the bridge. And this I did on site and I brought my little sketch pad and did it and never did anything with it. I keep thinking I should do a major painting of this wonderful view that I have, but I, I haven't yet done it someday. Next. Next slide. Okay, this is uh, from my side window in my dining room, looking at the Nyack Marina at this tall building. That's where Leontine lives, mm -hmm. she's watching. Um, and it was a wonderful thing to sketch. And uh, I was in so much for so long that I, I was sort of desperate to do something different. Uh, but I, I enjoyed looking, this was a great view. As you can see now the boats are out, but you know, in the winter they're all in, uh, uh, right in the marina. Next one. Uh, this, this was uh, not anything that I saw, but my kids were in um, France, in Saint Paul de Vence, I think. And they came home with photographs and they were dying to have a little watercolor or something. So this was looking between the buildings at, in the valley and it was done as a plein air sketch. This was done from a photograph, I was not there. I, I was there years ago, but not this time. The next one. Okay, now this is a, um, was a gift for my daughter. It's a, a coral specimen that I was very, um, carefully shading and everything else. And I decided it needed its own frame and setting. So I put in real shells at the bottom. And then as an afterthought, since I bead and I had coral shells, which I've used in necklaces, I added them to hang from the side. So when I go there, it's at a beach house, uh, I can enjoy that. Next. Okay, now these are completely different than watercolors. These are very textured. This is a small one. Um, I had a lot of fun with this. We, I used compounding stuff and it was very thick and gloppy and it was wonderful to do, but I discovered doing it in my little apartment here is very messy. So unless I do it outside on a terrace, I can't continue this. The next one. Now this was also, um, an acrylic abstraction, which someone else has now because they love the color. And uh, I enjoyed doing this very much. This was a class that we did, um, as I said, it was outdoors in, in some Catskill area. I did it with a friend and uh, I was planning to go back the next year, but then COVID started and I didn't go continue. Okay, now the Sumier, um, I don't have, I'll show the slide. Uh, I'm going to show you these. I don't have a finished painting, but I just show you some of the, I, I taught Sumie to our teachers as in service classes. And I learned, my sister-in-law gave me all these wonderful things that I'm going to show you shortly. And I learned how to use the brushes. And not that I became an expert, but um, I, I certainly enjoy doing bamboo and the leaves. And it's a very um, zen, quiet, thing to do because you really are in a thinking meditative state when you do this. This is real pleasure. And it was a pleasure using all the tools, which I said, I'll show you later. Continue. Now the pastels I started uh, here uh, two years ago. And this obviously was a winter scene of a sunrise from my terrace. And um, we've had some gorgeous sunrises uh, this one was actually, I started doing the pastels because of the sunrises. I said, they deserve to be on a pastel. It just seemed perfect. And I love the way the colors would just flow. And I also like the fact that I could do a pastel in a few hours, whereas a watercolor took a long, long time. Continue. This was a water scene. And there's one more, I think. The next one. Oh, you don't have that. Oh, okay. Okay, so now we're on to the quilting. Uh, next slide. This was the very first quilt that I finished. And I learned a lot from the teacher that I took because 
Um, I thought I knew everything there was to know about color, having taken so many color classes. And I'll just indicate what she did. She had us bring all our color swatches in certain sizes. And I brought what I wanted. And she said, look at your neighbor on one side or the other and switch some colors with them. And I looked and I said, I don't like any of their colors. <laughs> I like the ones I picked. And she said, well, if you're really unhappy with it, then you can use, you have enough of your own to make more. I said, okay. So I realized as soon as I switched with somebody else and inserted these colors, that this was the, um, how can I say, the, 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 the contrast and the most interesting thing in the quilt. Without these darks in there, it would have been very blah with just my colors. So I realized I had a lot to learn and uh, quilting is not necessarily um, a, a sure thing. This was quilted by hand. I no longer do it by hand. My hands uh, won't do that. I do more machine work. Continue. So this was the very first quilt. <laughs> okay, this is my last quilt. I finished this a few months ago. Um, this is a little wild and crazy. And I had all these wonderful fabrics that, from a designer named Kay Fassett, who was really a knitwear designer, who started making um, fabrics for sewing. And his fabrics were so wild and crazy. I used to use them when I would make purses. I made quilted purses for a while. I don't know if there's a picture there, but I'll show you one in the room. So this one, I started small and I, it was all like doing a positive and a negative. It, it, it worked out well, you, you, you do two of them together. You have one, one is the contrast and one is the solid and, uh, uh, excuse me, one is the print and one is the solid. And I had one that one was the positive and one was the negative. So it kept getting bigger and it like, it just grew. And uh, eventually it turned into a queen size quilt and at first I thought I was going to give it to somebody and I said, no, I kind of like this. So I'm holding on to it and I'll give it to one of my grandkids eventually or I'll make another one. Next. Uh, this is also a recent one and you really can't see what it is, but it's an underwater scene. I made this during COVID and I gave it to my nephew who is big on fish and scuba diving and everything else. He loved it. Continue. This one is really a crib quilt that I did some years ago. It's, I guess I call it an I spy quilt. And as it was a, a labor of love because I had all these different crazy fabrics and I went from the top left, which was light colors, horizontally going down to the bottom right, which is dark colors. And it, it just moved and it was really a challenge to find all the right things. I totally love it. And if I'm lucky enough to ever see a great grandchild, this is where it's going. <laughs> Next one. This is another quilt that I did some years ago that I finished during COVID. These use some Japanese yukata fabrics. Part of this was done by, quilted by hand and part by machine, but this is a recent one. Next one. Now this, no, you skip one, go back to that one. Yeah, no, you skip two. Uh, no, it's after this one. No, go on the next one. Keep going down. Well, that's it, okay. Uh, in California, I belong to a very active quilt guild and we had many groups that we would get together and this was great fun. We would do for each other parts of a quilt and then combine it. So I gave my friends uh, the theme, the theme was baskets. So everybody did a different basket. Some were uh, appliqued, some were quilted, some were uh, patched, and then I finished it up and it came out to be king size and it's too big for my bed here, but it will go to somebody that has a king size bed. Next one. Now this one was, you can't see it, but it was based on, it was, this was a baby quilt gifts. This baby is now 15. I did it for somebody in California. Uh, it's, it was based on the flower fairy alphabet. So the center of each one is a different month and a different flower fairy. And then I did the colors to go with it. Continue. 
oh, here. Now I started, um, and actually it's interesting, I had been to Nyack once visiting my daughter who lives in Suffern, and we went to some of the boutiques and I saw these little purses and I said, oh, I can do that, but I can quilt it. So I started gathering together fabrics and um, made, I made dozens of these for a while, I was selling them. Um, some of these are Japanese uh, obi sash fabrics left over. My sister-in-law used to send them to me and some are fabrics that went with it. It was great fun doing the front, uh, but finishing it was a job. I would have liked to have somebody or a factory do the, the work that wasn't as interesting as designing it. The designing it is the most fun. Next. Okay, now we come to, I guess, the, mo the next one the most, um, how can I say, recent kind of art that I'm doing. And it sort of started uh, when I was in California and I became interested in stones and I, I've used different kinds of stones. Some of them are real stones, like the one I'm wearing that you'll see. Some of them are dichroic glass. And all of these have as, as a neck piece, a braided, um, Japanese cord that's called kumihimo. I'll show you that later. Um, and that seemed to be a perfect thing for these focal ones. Next one. So this was a, a real stone that I, uh, when I work on this, I, I work on a, a flat felted back and these the beads are very tiny and they're stitched with a needle. Nothing is glued here. So the, the beads are encased over the stone and then around the periphery of the stone. And the necklace was made, it was a twisted beaded thing that took me forever to do. Uh, and I added the fringe. I love wearing this thing, it's long. Uh, I like it horizontal. It's just, it was a great design, a lot of fun. Next. Okay, in this case, um, this took me a while to figure out what to do with the, I thought these stones belonged together. So I mounted them together and I did the sewing together. And then um, I do this free form stitching where um, there's no pattern. You just sort of, it's like painting with beads. So it took me a while to accumulate the right color beads, the right texture, the right shapes. And I like to do it asymmetrically. So one side doesn't exactly match the other but it's certainly related to it. This was one of my favorite things. Next. Okay, well, I, I put these all together to talk about when I first started doing, this is called freeform peyote beading. It was to me, I used to call it painting with beads. I would start with one row in the middle that had some little ones, some bugle ones, some bigger ones, and then it'll go up and around and sew around. And then on top of it, I would put in like another layer of beads. It's all sewn in and uh, different kinds of clasps. And I use, sometimes I use pearls, sometimes I use freshwater pearls. Um, it's really painting with beads, getting the composition and the color unified so that it looks as if it's all one thing. Next. Now this was, <laughs> this was the only bracelet that I did like this. This is um, dyed Japanese fabric, I forget the name of it. And I used pearls on it. Uh, this was bought for I had a, a bead show, a jewelry show at the Nyack Library and uh, somebody bought it for her daughter-in-law who was an actress. So I actually saw it on her wrist. She sent me a picture and uh, it was a little extravagant looking but it was a lot of fun to do. I'm in the middle of doing another one that I haven't finished. I have a lot of unfinished things. Next one, I call them UFOs. <laughs> um, this is more of the beading stuff. Um, this one on top is crocheted. And in the middle, there's a, a, a blown glass bead um, that's, uh, I can't think of the name of it. Um, it's, it's a free form that people make and glass makers uh, make. So I buy, if I see something that I like, and then I put these pretty uh, end caps on. The other two are more of the working with beads and as you could see, I'm inter interested in the texture and the opening and the holes, and they're easy to wear and they're, they're fun to make. Next one. Okay, this one, um, 
sort of proves the point that anything with holes is doable for jewelry. Uh, this was a carved two-tone jade piece that I had for years. And it took me a while to accumulate the colors that would go with this. And I put it together, made earrings. I was gonna wear it and then I decided to wear something else. Um, but this was, um, starting with a, a piece like that is always uh, inspiration. And I look for this kind of thing to start, but continue. Now this was uh, right before COVID, I was in California and this was uh, serendipitous. I was in two different places and I found things that went together. The focal point is a glass dichroic bead. That means it's been melted in a kiln. And the beads of the necklace are, uh, have druzy, that's like a rough stone on them. And when I bought them in two separate places, I knew they had to live together. So when I came home, this was right at the beginning of COVID. That was the first thing I did. I put this on a backing and did the beads around it and added this. And this is also one of my favorite pieces. Next. Now this one um, is a druzy in the middle and uh, it has beads around it, the very tiny seed beads and some larger crystals. And then it has a clasp that's got stones in it. This was a gift for a friend of mine and uh, we did some bartering. Um, and I, I, I love giving things to people that I know they're gonna enjoy. Continue. Now this one, um, during COVID I discovered there was an online Turkish uh, website that had wonderful gold plated Turkish things. And this is a dress, a kimono that I bought and added uh, the beaded uh, cord, the spiral cord on one side and the regular beads on the other. So this was an inspiration piece. Next. Now this was a little crazy. I have this here to show you. This little face was a pretty little face carved out of probably resin and I made it into a mermaid. And it took me a long time till I beaded the hair and the body and everything else. And I didn't know what to do with it. So I made this necklace and then just recently put a clasp, a safety clasp of a pin so I could wear it with the pin attached to me and the necklace is separate. That was fun to do. Next. And here's just a, a couple more things. Uh, you can see the rhodochrosite, the pink one, which is a very special stone with the carved around it. Um, there's a bracelet that looks like a herringbone weave. That's the only pattern that I tend to use. You, otherwise I don't use patterns. And this is one of the discs that I then did some asymmetrical thing with another bracelet. And this purple stone is a Mexican stone that is a real stone. I found it hard to believe that it wasn't dyed. Next one. This is interesting because this was uh, a Kumihimo cord and a very beautiful stone with pearls on it that I made for a niece who lives in uh, North Carolina. And she wore it for a while. And then she sent me this picture. Uh, she's in a big craft area near Asheville, no, North Carolina. And she bought this gourd and she decided the gourd needed a necklace. So, <laughs> so the gourd is now wearing the necklace. I think she can take it off and wear it if she wants, but I thought this was an unusual <laughs> way to display one of my pieces. Okay, is that the end of the slides? Oh no, there's one more. There's one more slide. Oh, mm -hmm. this is, um, if anyone is interested, you can look on, I have a website that, um, that has a little bit of everything on it. This was a dichroic bead, the glass, and it kind of grew. And then after I finished, I decided it was too horizontal and it needed the fringe. And I think the fringe really makes it. I think that's all the stuff to it. But now that I've seen hers, I am inspired to do it. I have all the um, beads. I have all the beads and everything else to do it. 
and there's no reason for me except my own laziness to get finished with this. I wanted to show you a few pieces that I have. Oh, so I know what I want to show you. I want to show you the Kumihimo. This is a, a craft that a lot of women do. You don't have to be an artist to do it. You just have to be interested in crafts. It reminds me of as a kid, you know, we did horse reins. Did anybody do that with a little horse rein? You know, we did, you weave over. But anyhow, this is a foam piece that has indentations. And what's coming out of this is a cord and there's a weight at the bottom. So in this case, my cord is multicolored because I decided at the time. So I have different cords. Each one of these is a different color. This one, which is a kumihimo, was all one color. And this is braided the same way. And then I put these uh, end caps on and I, attached something to it. So in a way, these kumihimo things are more substantial than a little cord, and you can custom make them to whatever colors you like, which is a wonderful thing. Um, the only thing about this is you have to keep track of where you are, but there's a way of doing that. Wherever there's three, I know that's where the next one is. So I don't know why I was making this so long. I must have had something in mind, but I never finished it. Um, but I have another UFO, which I, could, I know what I had in mind. I made this cord out of these colors because I had these two glass pieces. Um, I went to a, I went to a, a bead exhibit in, um, Portland, Oregon some years ago, and they were selling everything by weight. It was a real bargain. So I bought all kinds of stuff. I've got boxes of beads and you name it, I have it here. So these two were, my plan was to bead around them and incorporate this into the cord. In other words, use this. So this is a design problem that I haven't yet solved and uh, someday will solve. Um, I wanted to show you this and then we'll see if there are any questions. Oh, it fell on the floor. <laughs> so it's, I was just gonna show it to you because anything with a hole is game. So this was um, a shell, a, uh, I'm losing the, losing the shell. You know, these iridescent shells and I forgot what it's called. And I, the hole was too big in here, so I put in a sequin abalone shell. And it took, you see, it's, it's all tangled because it fell on the floor. It, it has strands of cords with different abalone shells. It took me a while to find the pieces for this, and eventually uh, I finished it. It's got all kinds of dangling, well, you can see the base of it. It has some mm -hmm. fish and some other things. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a summer kind of necklace thing. And this one is interesting because uh, these are two dichroic pieces that I bought and I said they belong together. So mm -hmm. I put them on a backing. This by the way is, is, is a new backing. It's on a, a white foam backing. This is ultra suede in the back. And I tried to make it so that the beads would look as if they were connected, the design. And I did around it and did this spiral thing and a fringe. And uh, this is one, it just seemed perfect. I used coral and I found coral that would fit into these little spaces. I had a whole assortment. This is real coral. Nowadays, you can't get real coral. You get resin, they all look the same. So basically, that's it. The only other thing that I really wanted to, to show you, oh, I wanted to show you the mermaid. I don't know if you can see her face. Can you see her face? Yeah, yeah. And this was uh, a labor of love because I really spent a lot of time with it. And then recently I added the ultra suede and the, and the uh, safety catch so it can be pinned. And at the same time, there is a necklace that goes with it. So the necklace can be pinned to the thing. So 
I, I have enough stuff that I can wear forever <laughs> and never get. <laughs> um, I was going to show you only one of the uh, plein air pictures because that's the only one that's loose. This was done in Spain. And this is, uh, and maybe somebody's been there, is Rhonda. Rhonda looks like a, um, a miniature Grand Canyon, but a village yeah. is over it. And I remember being so enthralled with the depths of it and, you know, so I did a sketch there and then I came home and basically it's still a sketch, but uh, this is the kind of plein air stuff that I do. So as you see, uh, I've been busy, um, <laughs> even though there were, there were years that I didn't have time to, to paint serious paintings. I mean, like the watercolors and um, I still found other things to do. And uh, that's the beauty of, uh, of being interested and I, I hope to continue. I have enough UFOs to last me for, <laughs> for years. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> yes. Um, am I on mute? Yeah. No, no I hear can you. hear me. So I'm I'm curious. Um, you know I love all your work, by the way, and I'm so glad to see Thank you today. You. This is another another one of the artists who, who will hear the <laughs> Yes. Um, so the, the glass, I forget what you called them, dia, the glass pieces that you use them in dichroic, dichroic. how do you, I, I'm curious about the, the adhesive, like how do you make them stay on a background surface? Uh, well, they're flat on the back. Yeah. And they're three dimensional on the front, like this one, you know. Right, but how do you attach it to the back, I guess is my question. That's the only place where I use glue. And this is the backing that I use. It's called lacy stitch stuff. It's not like Pellon, but it looks like Pellon. So I basically glue the stone to this. I leave what kind my, of glue? What kind of glue? Uh, well built, just plain glue, nothing <laughs> special. Uh, uh, I have special glues for stones, but for this, uh, I just use plain glue, can even use... Uh, I've even used Elmer's um, and I make sure not to glue it right to the edge because I sometimes want to get into the edge. Right. Um, and once you glue it, then you can work with it around and uh, anything that has a flat back, you know, can be glued. The, uh, the back of this, of this little face was flat. This is a piece of resin. So this was glued on in anticipation of being a mermaid, I glued it on a big piece, knowing that I was going to sketch the, the, the and sometimes I, I, someone asked me a question, I don't know if that'll come up, do you plan anything? Well, I have to start with the jewelry, with the jewelry, it's really sounds crazy, I don't plan anything, it just happens. Um, the beads, how can I say, the beads will talk to me, uh, here's one of those um, what I call, you know, uh, free form peyote. The bees will just, if I have too many little squat ones, I'll use a round one and then I just continue. And then you can see it on the back and then I make holes in it and make it lacy. And then on the front, I find other bees that are bigger that can show off. So these are totally unplanned. And if I do two trying to do the same thing, they won't come out the same way. Um, if I'm doing something like, well, like this one, you saw the slide of this. Uh, this was unplanned too, because I got the beads. I mean, I had this piece, had this piece for a few years. And then till I found these, which colors would go with it, um, I looked at it and decided, you know, one side should have more going on than the other, but yet there has to be a continuation of color. And um, I, I try to knot things in between so that they're sturdy. And uh, I mean, you, you hope that everything is sturdy, but I've had the experience of a young person who told me she wore my necklace to bed every night. Eventually, it's, <laughs> I said, you don't even wear diamonds to bed every night. You know, you have to give it air and let it breathe. So um, it just sort of happens. But I, as far as planning ahead, the quilts have to be planned ahead and I'm not that mathematical. So that's a challenge. And, um, and certainly the paintings, I kind of know what I'm doing, but I, the jewelry just takes off. <laughs> Any other questions? I just want to say that I'm wearing one of uh, 
Arlene's beautiful necklaces and her bracelet. It's so special. It goes with everything. And I just love it. It's sparkly. That, and bracelet, that bracelet has two layers. There's an underlayer. And then on top of it, there's a vertical. Can you see the colors go from blues to pinks? So there's another layer of stuff. And that just mm -hmm. sort of happened. I, I didn't plan it. And, um, has and it's very hard. It's hard to bracelets. You know, everybody has a different size wrist. So you make something and then it doesn't fit somebody. It's, you know, it's amazing how different our wrists are. I just want to say that we have several Nancy's going to be our third artist and we have Susan Eisen and Ruth Jenislau at one point they did present to for our learning collaborative so I feel very fortunate getting to know these wonderful artists that was amazing yeah. this is why I've been bugging Arlene for a year to show her her work because when you come yeah. into her apartment it's beautiful here <laughs> Well, I can't have everybody at once, but I could have a couple people at a time. If you want to come let, get in touch with me, I could give you the 10 or tour and the stuff that I haven't taken out. I have too much. Uh, I guess I should show you. <laughs> too much stuff. <laughs> and I'm pretty well organized. People say, oh, you're so organized. But if I wouldn't be. I would spend my whole time looking for things. It's just beyond, um, I mean, the fact that, that there are beads here and there's paint here and there's pastels here. Um, when I first moved here, I, I was, couldn't figure out how to manage. So then I put in these shelves and I added another, uh, this shelf on top here, which has all the beads and other stuff in it. So. Um, the organization is almost crucial when you have very small space. Uh, when I had a house and I was spread out, I didn't know how lucky I was <laughs> to, to fit everything in. Any other questions? I'd, I'd like to make a comment. I am yes. so, I'm so impressed by the scope of your talent because oh. it is wide and there are so, the media that you've used is so vast and it shows the same talent and design and beauty in everything you've been showing us. Thank you so much. <laughs> I have a daughter who has been quilting for years uh -huh. and been involved in art. So I'm quite aware of some of the things you do. And I thank you very much. It's been oh, a- Oh, you're very welcome. Um, I was gonna just talk about the, the quilting. There was one bag on the pictures, but I have another one here. This is a small one and this one, um, was, oh, I have another one. Wait, let me get this one here. I want to buy everything that I see here. Yes. <laughs> uh, this one has, well, the back, this one has a back that's quilted uh, and a front. And this one has uh, a lap. So I usually I start with a, a shape and then I do like a log cabin around it. But here was a case where I saw this fabric that reminded me of a Brock still life painting. And I said, I don't want to cut this up. So what I did was I quilted around it and I just used that. And the back is uh, a textured uh, fabric that I found. And the other thing that happens is that I needed clasps. So it's not enough to have buttons. So you have to find special buttons. So this one is a uh, a horn button, this one is a coin. And then I started, it was crazy. I have a whole oh, bin of buttons. I got rid of most of them, <laughs> but each thing requires, how can I say it? It requires many materials. And you don't wanna be sitting there when you finish this bag and say, now I have to go out and get a clasp. I have to have an assortment of clasps. So because of that, you wind up with far too much stuff, you know, and that's why. <laughs> Uh, I had to get rid of so much. <laughs> but if your daughter is quilting, I'm sure she has plenty of fabric and uh, it's kind of an obsession. But mm -hmm. I think if, if you do one art form that you are, how can I say, you're amenable to others. I mean, when I first started as, I didn't mention that, I used to do needlepoint pillows. I have them all over the house. Uh, it was designing them, it was making them. So I think the, in, in my case, the arts didn't just follow in one path. Maybe it should have, but my life didn't follow in one path. I had a very complicated life. I moved, I had children, I traveled. I, 
So it, it was like in each place, I mean, I was lucky that in each place I could do what I could do. And I was also lucky that I had a, a wonderful sister-in-law who's gone now, who lived in Lima and in Japan and in, and she sent me, she was into this. So she would send me things I have um, from the Sambla Indians, you know, pieces and I have different things. So it was enough to, you get a piece like that and you say, oh, well, what can I do with it? You know, so it, it, it would be useful in quilting or in, in clothing, you know. So I, I was fortunate, I really was. Anybody else have a question? Arlene, do you think yes. you could put up your website again? Your website, your information. Um, you had the you slide. Um, that was one of the last slides. Uh, yeah, there it is. Well, it's my name. It's arlenleventhal.com. R okay, thank you. Seven fifteen. Yeah. Okay, and. Uh, if anyone else has anything to say or comment or... Arlene, you're amazing. No. Yes. And I don't, we... can, you put up, can you put up the pictures instead of the slides so I can see everybody? One other thing is that I haven't gone on to see... Oh, there are more people on the next slide. Oh, okay. See, on my iPad, I only see uh, 12, but then if I move the other... Oh, so we have a nice audience. Yeah. And uh, Nancy is on here and we're gonna see her and uh, yeah. her work. And Susan, Susan was the one who's- uh, I don't know what that means. Raise your hand, Susan, <laughs> who, who is a potter. And I have to say, after looking at her work, I started thinking, well, look what she accomplished. <clears throat> she had one ceramics interest. She developed it, she did a lot with it. And then I started thinking, and I'm flitting around with everything, but, but on the other hand, Susan's lived in the same place for 40 years and, and has had a different life than I had. And um, I think you, you learn to adapt to, to what you can do. Uh -huh. And I never had a studio space until we were in Pomona and then I was 65 years old. <laughs> so I would work wherever I could find a space. And I drove my husband crazy because of the supplies he kept saying More <laughs> stuff, you know um he couldn't get over how much i needed to continue doing this and then i think that's always a shock for a non-artist to to realize what the supplies require for each of these art forms i think it's There's also arlene though that you get inspired by the stuff you're yes. handling something and you say oh that and that Yes, and I think yeah, very talking. often that's that's the, the key by um, by going to a museum after not going, let's say for two, three years, um, that triggers something and it, it even though you haven't been working, it gives you an idea to continue with something. And I think that that's the beauty of, of visiting museums and galleries and continuing. Right. And I, right. And I think you're going into different areas. Is to, I have done it too. It's funny, you just zeroed in. The clay is the biggest, but trying yes. your hand at other things feeds into each thing, feeds into the, the rest of it. Your, the colors that you're working with will feed into your painting, and the yeah. painting will feed into. I mean, so it's, it's, it's yeah. really a continuum, it's just not a straight line. I just remembered I wanted to say something about this because. I had seen somebody do this and I said, oh, how do you get this undulating thing? And they said, use different size beads. Uh -huh. So I, mm -hmm. I, this I looked up in a magazine. I used the very tiny ones. So the tiny ones are set in and then a middle size one and then a big one. So the big one is the gold one, which is out. So by using different sizes, it's, it's not even different colors by using different sizes. Mm -hmm. And this stone is called a mo moakite. It's um, a natural stone that's got yellows and oranges and green. And then it was, it was a challenge to do the outside of it. Somebody asked me whether it, it was possible to glue on the stones. And I said, it might be, but I, I never did that because you want to encase the stone. So by sewing you have, and you don't sew with thread, you're sewing with a, um, it's a wire type thread very, very fine with a needle, needle in a hole. 
And that enables you to encase it. Whereas if you were to glue on there, it's just, it's, it would be kind of messy. So basically the sewing skills come in handy. Okay. Did Susan have a question, Susan Klein? Unmute, Susan, can you unmute please? Arlene, thank you. I am inspired by you and I love your sense of spontaneity and that you change from thing to thing and let go and get into it in a free way. And you've inspired me. I have a quilt that's waiting for me to make for <laughs> my grandson is over a year and I usually make them for children before they're born. And I haven't touched it. It's a UFO. So I'm comforted by your UFOs and stop feeling guilty about it and just do it already. Do it, right. So maybe this summer will be the time. And thank you. You're very welcome. I didn't mention anything about knitting because I do knit. <laughs> and the knitting has happened at times in my life that I couldn't do anything else, but I had to do something. I was living with my sister-in-law in LA for three months till we found a house in California. So I, I started knitting again. And then I started knitting when I had grandchildren because I had to knit something for them. And then I didn't pick it up for many years. And during COVID, I started knitting again. Um, I have put aside for the great grandchildren that I have yet to see. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I did these uh, sweaters that go um, that reverse you know what do you call the wrap sweaters several of those and then I started making crib quilts I mean it's I think if I hadn't been in the in the house for so long I wouldn't have done a lot of this stuff but this kept me how can I say kept me alive I wanted I wanted to share Arlene um, so I, I went to visit Arlene multiple times to see her work and talk oh, yeah, about she, it. She did the slides for me. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I gained such a friend in you, Arlene. And, and um, the last time I was at the apartment, <laughs> Arlene pulled out this box that said UFOs. And I'm like, well, <laughs> Well, that's strange. And I, and I finally was like, "Uf, what is this UFO?" And she said, "Unfinished object." And I went, "Oh my gosh, that's so perfect." That's, that's like, like well, I'm quilters quilters use box. that expression. I don't know if your daughter uses that. Uh, that's a, a, a quilter's expression, which I had never heard before either. Great, but it certainly suits um, many of us that do crafts. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll ask a question and firstly this was stunning your work is absolutely gorgeous so well, we, I was going to say uh, Stephanie is um, Sally's daughter and she's a Google person so she is the <laughs> she's the insurance behind this yeah, it's, it's wonderful to be here I'm honored I am Steph Borgman my wonderful mother <laughs> right here um, and it's just such a pleasure and honor to join all of you today. I live in Australia so it's not often I get to be on this side of the world um, and see the work of Arlene in the flesh in person so it's been um, beautiful and just a, a pleasure to join all of you and, and meet all of you because I hear such wonderful things from my mom <laughs> and how brilliant each of you are and your talents. Arlene I was wondering your work is so diverse. So you have quilts and jewelry and, and paintings. When you put this presentation together and you reflected on all the diversity of your work over the years, what were you most proud of? Um, I guess I'm most proud of the watercolors because they were um, difficult and it took a lot of uh, unlearning the way I used to paint with watercolors to the way I paint now. Uh, and the other problem with watercolors, it was tending to get too realistic. And I had to back off and be, because you don't want, you don't want it to look like a photograph. So um, it, it was just getting the balance of, I wanted the realism and yet I wanted the freedom of the strokes and everything else. So I guess it's the, um, um, the watercolors that I'm proudest of, but I get a big kick out of the jewelry because everybody relates to jewelry. You can't find a woman that doesn't relate to jewelry. <laughs> and when somebody is uh, wearing something that, that I made, I get such pleasure out of it. And uh, whether it's sold or I've given it as a gift, it's just a wonderful thing. Um, I have enough stones that I could live to be 200 years old. And <laughs> <laughs> 
I have stones that have stones. And I, even now, if I go someplace and I see something that has a hole in the right place, I will buy it, which is ridiculous. Um, and I paid very little in some cases for these things. You know, it's not like I've gone to a gem show and bought a real, I mean, these abalone things, I remember this man had three or four shells like this. I have another necklace that I made with it. I didn't pay that much for it, but when I finished with it, it was a, a labor that was very intensive, you know. So it's the fun of the search, you know. It's just the kind of person that likes to go into a shop and poke around. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing. And there's also a few comments in the chat. Um, Nancy said your work is just spectacular, and I love it. On um, some of the who said that? Shout Nancy. And also, um, Rena has said your work is beautiful and so unique. Are they for sale? Um, some of the jewelry is for sale. Um, I have some on my website of the jewelry that's for sale. Generally, the paintings and the quilts are not. But I mean, I could do a quilt for if necessary for somebody. But um, there is some jewelry for sale. And the other thing that I have done, which is really fun, is I've made a jewelry piece for a specific outfit for somebody. I love doing that. I've had people come to me with a dress and say, "Why well, I need something with it. And that's fun, too. So the comments by and make an appointment to come to see it's right she's right down in Nyack and you're in Piermont and I just want to say that it's such been such a privilege for me to get to know Susan Eisen and she has a beautiful studio just right in Saddle River across the you know the line to New Jersey and uh of course Arlene and Nancy and I think Ruth dropped off but we have such amazing people that come to the learning collaborative and it's been a privilege for me the only negative was I felt like a a slide. after seeing what what Arlene did over the pandemic how productive she was and how much she created I went home and I went <laughs> I'm, a, I'm like a like a turtle I don't know why I haven't done anything well I you know we all try to read too I'm in a book group so I have to keep up with that but in a way it's a good thing it's taken a lot of the loneliness out of being by myself for the first time in my life I was married for 61 very good years and um, being in Nyack has been a real plus because there's more going on here, certainly than where I was before. And I've met very interesting people through CAN and through the Learning Collaborative. And, um, and I appreciated Sally's pursuing me. <laughs> <laughs> she wouldn't let go. But <laughs> after, after I had seen what Susan did, I said, well, maybe I could do it. But I couldn't do it without Nancy because Nancy put the slides together, you know, so. We've had a lot of help. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much Thank you Thank for you. listening Thank to me. And you. Anybody Thank wants you. to come over and do anything or talk about your quilts, you know, I'd be perfectly happy. I'd love company. Bye, -bye right. now. Thank you very Thank much. You. Don't forget to join us all for the next. We have Nancy. She's going to be on the, is it the 28th, Nancy? Nancy's amazing. You should see her work. Oh, my God. And also we have uh, Janine uh, Evers, who actually used to place her, her uh, work in a studio in, K in Provincetown in Cape Cod. So some of you may visit up there. You can get to know her. So we're, we're pretty privileged to have this series of artists. I, I want to just add something about you, Sally. Um, when you got on the Program Development Committee for the Learning Collaborative, things changed. And you have brought in all kinds of other things that weren't there before. And uh, I think it's really fantastic. Yeah, You've well, had wonderful you. ideas. You are okay. Thank you. <laughs> agreed, agreed. You are a force, Sally. <laughs> yes. You really you are. are. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, you are. It's, it's, it's 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 slouch. Like, congratulations, <laughs> Arlene. Yeah. Thank you. This is wonderful. Right. It's nice meeting you, Stephanie, and you're wonderful. Thank you, Steph. Oh, you're welcome. You're wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all. Enjoy the rest of our summer series. Will do. Okay. Bye, all. Bye, Bye. all.